Dogmas and Doctrines of the Catholic Church, Part 1. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. And you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, you instructed the hearts of those who believed in you by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant us in the same Spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Public revelation ended with Christ and the Apostles. Sententia Certa. Definition This doctrine states that God will no longer give us any new divine revelation after the death of Christ and the last Apostle, in this case, Saint John, who died on 100 AD. The reason for this is simple. Because Jesus is God made flesh, the second person of the Trinity, everything that is necessary for man's salvation is fully contained in his teachings. He did not leave behind an incomplete ministry during his time on earth. Therefore, the age of revelation officially ended after his ascension, as well as the death of the apostles to whom he commissioned to spread the gospel. Proof from Scripture Divine teaching in the form of revelation has always been given to various individuals throughout history, specifically to the patriarchs and prophets of Israel, God's chosen people. This revelation was gradual, not instantaneous, stretching through time and slowly being built up, until it finally reaches its apex in Christ, God's ultimate revelation. This is attested to in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 2. At various times in the past and in various different ways, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. But in our own time, the last days, he has spoken to us through his Son. Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 demonstrates Jesus' work as the complete fulfillment of the old covenant that was revealed to the Jews, when he acknowledges this fact. Do not imagine that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to complete them. In Matthew chapter 5 verses 21 to 22 and similar passages, Jesus further states that his authority exceeds that of Moses, and the Torah. You have learned how it was said to our ancestors, you must not kill. And if anyone does kill, he must answer for it before the court. But I say this to you. Anyone who is angry with his brother, will answer for it before the court. Jesus' role as the ultimate teacher of humanity is also mentioned in Matthew chapter 23 verse 10, which states, Nor must you allow yourselves to be called teachers, for you have only one teacher, the Christ. The final verse of Matthew's Gospel alludes to this when the apostles receive the Great Commission. And teach them to observe all the commands I gave you and know that I am with you always. Yes, to the end of time. Similarly, because the apostles were close companions of Christ and primary witnesses to his life, everything that they profess must be taken as part of divine revelation. They themselves viewed Christ as the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel. Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 confirms this belief. But when the appointed time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born a subject of the law. The apostle's primary task was to preserve, in its entirety and without any error, the deposit of faith handed over to them by Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 14 alludes to this. I put to you the duty of doing all that you have been told, with no faults or failures, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul also warns Timothy in verse 20, not to get swayed by teachings other than that which the apostles pledge. My dear Timothy, take great care of all that has been entrusted to you. Have nothing to do with the pointless philosophical discussions and antagonistic beliefs of the knowledge which is not knowledge at all. In his second letter to Timothy, Paul further expounds on the mission of the apostles to preserve Christ's truth. 
Chapter 1 verse 14 states. You have been trusted to look after something precious. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Picking the subject up again in chapter 2 verse 2, Paul demonstrates the concept of handing on the faith to succeeding generations without any admixture of error. You have heard everything that I teach in public. Hand it on to reliable people so that they in turn will be able to teach others. The final reason why the doctrines imparted by Christ and his followers cannot be added to, deleted from, or contradicted in any way, is because truth is ultimately immutable. The divine nature of Jesus cannot deceive, nor is it incomplete, nor is it rendered irrelevant depending on the time or culture. As Psalm 117 verse 2 testifies. For his love is strong. His faithfulness eternal. Mark chapter 13 verse 31, summarizes this view beautifully. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Proof from Tradition Tradition has consistently condemned from the very beginning of the Church's institution, the notion that certain individuals or groups, often called Gnostics, have secret knowledge about a divine truth that neither Christ nor his apostles taught. Saint Irenaeus in Book 3, Chapter 1 of his work, Against Heresies, decries this concept. It is within the power of all, therefore, in every church, who may wish to see the truth, to contemplate clearly the tradition of the apostles manifested throughout the whole world. And we are in a position to reckon up those who were by the apostles instituted bishops in the churches, and to demonstrate the succession of these men to our own times. Those who neither taught nor knew of anything like what these heretics rave about. For if the apostles had known hidden mysteries, which they were in the habit of imparting to the perfect apart and privily from the rest, they would have delivered them especially to those to whom they were also committing the churches themselves. For they were desirous that these men should be very perfect and blameless in all things, whom also they were leaving behind as their successors, delivering up their own place of government to these men. Which men, if they discharged their functions honestly, would be a great boon to the church, but if they should fall away, the direst calamity. Similarly, Tertullian in chapter 21 of his work, The Prescription Against Heretics, reinforces the concept, that no revelations other than that of Christ and the Apostles are to be taken as truth. From this, therefore, do we draw up our rule. Since the Lord Jesus Christ sent the Apostles to preach, our rule is that no others ought to be received as preachers than those whom Christ appointed. For no man knows the Father save the Son, and he to whomever the Son will reveal him. Nor does the Son seem to have revealed him to any other than the Apostles, whom he sent forth to preach, that, of course, which he revealed to them. Now, what that was which they preached, in other words, what it was which Christ revealed to them, can, as I must here likewise prescribe, properly be proved in no other way than by those very churches which the Apostles founded in person, by declaring the Gospel to them directly themselves, both viva voce, as the phrase is, and subsequently by their epistles. If, then, these things are so, it is in the same degree manifest that all doctrine which agrees with the Apostolic Churches, those molds and original sources of the faith must be reckoned for truth, as undoubtedly containing that which the said churches received from the Apostles, the Apostles from Christ, Christ from God. Whereas all doctrine must be prejudged as false, which savors of contrariety to the truth of the churches and Apostles of Christ and God. It remains, then, that we demonstrate whether this doctrine of ours, of which we have now given the rule, has its origin in the tradition of the Apostles, and whether all other doctrines do not ipso facto proceed from falsehood. We hold communion with the apostolic churches because our doctrine is in no respect different from theirs. This is our witness of truth. The First Vatican Council instituted an excommunication to anyone who holds that doctrines and dogmas can be invalidated with the progress of science and philosophy, thereby rendering the very concept of divine truth itself as something that is changeable. If anyone shall have said that it is possible that to the dogmas declared by the Church, a meaning must sometimes be attributed according to the progress of science, 
different from that which the Church has understood and understands, let him be anathema. In the pontificate of Pope Pius X, a decree of the Holy Office titled, Lamentabili, on July 3, 1907, condemned the proposition that, revelation, constituting the object of Catholic faith, was not completed with the Apostles, as a modernist heresy. Pope Pius XII's encyclical, Humani Generis, decried the encroaching aspect of theological relativism, wherein the work done by the Church under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, is cast aside in favor of new, man-made doctrines that are ultimately unsustainable. Hence to neglect, or to reject, or to devalue so many and such great resources which have been conceived, expressed, and perfected so often by the age-old work of men endowed with no common talent and holiness, working under the vigilant supervision of the Holy Magisterium, and with the light and leadership of the Holy Ghost, in order to state the truths of the faith ever more accurately. To do this so that these things may be replaced by conjectural notions and by some formless and unstable tenets of a new philosophy, tenets which, like the flowers of the field, are in existence today and die tomorrow. This is supreme imprudence, and something that would make dogma itself a reed shaken by the wind. The contempt for terms and notions habitually used by scholastic theologians, leads of itself to the weakening of what they call speculative theology, a discipline which these men consider devoid of true certitude, because it is based on theological reasoning. Finally, the Catechism of the Catholic Church summarizes this view. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture make up a single sacred deposit of the Word of God, in which, as in a mirror, the pilgrim church contemplates God, the source of all her riches. The Christian economy, therefore, since it is the new and definitive covenant, will never pass away. And no new public revelation is to be expected before the glorious manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Special Concerns it is important not to confuse this doctrine as stating that theological knowledge cannot progress. As the Catechism continues. Yet, even if revelation is already complete, it has not been made completely explicit. It remains for Christian faith gradually to grasp its full significance over the course of the centuries. Saint Vincent Leon summarizes this view in Chapter 23 of his work, Commonitary. But perhaps, someone says. Will there then be no progress in the religion of Christ? Certainly, there should be, even a great and rich progress, only, it must in truth be a progress in faith and not an alteration of faith. For progress, it is necessary that something should increase of itself. For alteration, however, that something should change from one thing to the other. The following situations are therefore entirely consistent with this doctrine, and is in no way heretical. Number 1. Articles of faith that were only implicitly believed by the Christian faithful, becomes a teaching that is explicitly proposed by the Church. For example, praying for the dead. Number 2. Beliefs that were not formal dogmas, becomes officially pronounced as dogmas. For example, the Immaculate Conception. Number 3. Concepts that are not well defined are stated in a clearer way to prevent confusion and misunderstanding. For example, transubstantiation. Number 4. Theological debates between Christians are settled once and for all, so that which teachings are orthodoxy and which are heresy become clear. For example, justification by faith alone. Number 5. Private revelation that applies a particular teaching to a specific stage in history. For example, the Marian apparition in Fatima. And number 6. Individual Catholics who are ignorant of the faith, who study privately or take classes, so that they can progress in their knowledge. With regards to private revelation, the Church accepts them provided that they do not contradict an existing teaching. This is summarized in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Throughout the ages, there have been so-called, private, revelations, some of which have been recognized by the authority of the Church. They do not belong, however, to the deposit of faith. 
It is not their role to improve or complete Christ's definitive revelation, but to help live more fully by it in a certain period of history. Guided by the magisterium of the Church, the sensus fidelium knows how to discern and welcome in these revelations, whatever constitutes an authentic call of Christ or his saints to the Church. Christian faith cannot accept, revelations, that claim to surpass or correct the revelation of which Christ is the fulfillment. This is the end of Dogmas and Doctrines of the Catholic Church, Part 1. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.